It's an uh, extreme pleasure for me to uh, introduce uh, tonight's speaker, Frederick Migaru, um, who is a, a chief curator and director of architectural and design section at the Centre Pompidou in Paris. And um, also, I remember first time getting in touch with uh, Frederick's work, which was in uh, 2003, during uh, what in my mind was the most important uh, exhibition or a showcase of the work, experimental work in architecture being done in the, with the generation of uh, 90s. Um, and since I was studying at Columbia, um, uh, end of 90s, this was somehow the, the epicenter of uh, this kind of research. It was very interesting to see um, uh, this amazing exhibition at the Centre Pompidou with some of the uh, wildest architects uh, of that generation doing a very experimental research that was curated uh, organized by Frederick. And also at the time, um, it was also very interesting for me that Frederick uh, uh, basically um, introduced some concepts for, uh, or tried to somehow uh, connect certain concepts from mathematics and uh, non uh, more specifically non-standard uh, analytical processes in mathematics uh, to this generation of architects because at the time, um, lots of architects were experimenting by um, using this kind of uh, software written for different industries, like for instance, uh, film industry. So in a more kind of representational way, uh, taking this kind of uh, written for, uh, for, um, for sort of um, other purposes like production of uh, visual special effects and using it to produce certain uh, very rich, uh, let's say, architectural imagination. So, uh, uh, this exhibition on, of non, on non-standard architecture was very interesting and just a few days uh, after I also um, uh, had a chance to go to uh, FRAC, uh, FRAC Institute which is close to Paris and, and um, again uh, is uh, probably the most amazing uh, uh, collection of progressive architecture in the world and, and this was also the first time when I had a chance to see this kind of uh, what um, Frederick is also calling uh, alternative history of architecture, amazing collection of uh, everyone in the last 50 years who did a very interesting progressive research. So something that I wasn't taught in uh, necessarily when I was studying architecture. Uh, so it's, uh, again, amazing collection that also was initiated uh, and curated largely by Frederick. So uh, uh, Frederick is almost like a, one could say a godfather of, uh, of a kind of uh, uh, progressive architecture in the world. So, so I think it's very uh, good to have him uh, speak tonight and also I, I maybe posed a little provocation to maybe try to uh, discuss or define what could be a possible uh, differentiation of this generation of the 90s um, of progressive research to maybe emerging generation that is um, um, happening today working more explicitly with code and computation and mathematics and also more explicitly with production processes. So I'm sure it will be a very interesting evening. Hello. Uh, it's curious for me to, to begin with very old things. Uh, an exhibition I made in uh, 2003, but I thought about I was not at the Pompidou, surely at the end of the 90s. Uh, it was non-standard architecture. And I began with this picture. I began with this picture because this is a very, well, this was very important for me. It's a model uh, of a Weierstrass curve uh, made by Poincaré, Henri Poincaré, in 1902. Uh, and uh, because he, he wanted to represent uh, uh, n-dimensional space and algorithmic space, and he tried to make models. And now there is a huge collection of models still now in the Poincaré Institute. And uh, it was surely the first representation of a mathematical curve. Uh, some existed surely in the 17th century. We know that. Leibniz uh, tried to think about this, how to, f to materialize uh, mathematical space. But uh, it was developed, uh, developed at the beginning of the century by Poincaré. And this, this picture is very important. I will tell you uh, why. Uh, first thing, I made an exhibition, and of course, uh, beginning of the 90s, 93, 94, I came to New York and I visited the Columbia, and I met uh, fine people, <laughs> like uh, Ani Rashid, for example, and of course, I discovered, I was very fascinated to discover a new way to produce architecture differently from the neo-modern, postmodern way, 
uh, referential idea of architecture dealing with uh, traditional geometry uh, we found everywhere uh, all over the world. And uh, this, uh, this uh, idea uh, for me appear as a really a, a shift, a first shift. Uh, and I try to understand it, and I frame it through this idea of a non-standard architecture. I work with all those architects, I collected all those architects, I know them very well. And I met this exhibition in Paris, and uh, we go quite quickly. Uh, as you see, there is uh, a floor, and uh, it was, it's a surely, the, for me, a very important part of the, of, of, the, of the exhibition, and a ribbon with many, many references, because the idea was to give the references to the people, not to use them as an outside field. You can pick up element for a syntax, but to solve the idea of the history, giving the references to the people in this fluid uh, ribbon, suspended ribbon. Of course, it's an open exhibition, completely fluid, and I ask to uh, different teams to work, uh, to work with, uh, with me. Uh, very well-known architects like Greg Lean, Asim Todd, Van Berkel, uh, Cash, and so on. And everybody show uh, different works, different way of working also, but mostly uh, defined by uh, morphogenetic uh, design through uh, genetic algorithm. And I discovered that the architects are playing or dealing with uh, software they don't know so well, even the most advanced of them. They, they, they're using uh, the idea of the differential equation to, in the algorithm to create shape and movement in the shape. But the other part of the, the, the other important part of the, the exhibition was to, to deal with the connection between prod conception and production. And it was the concept very innovative for me of the uh, uh, from file to factory. It was the first the idea to define in a big exhibition that the idea is possible to change the idea of the production from file to factory. And I play with the title non-standard architecture in two ways and surely it created the, at the period many ambiguity. Non-standard means of course non-standard, absolutely non-standard, against standardization, against normativity in production. And the other part is it means it plays also with the mathematical idea of the non-standard analysis. And of course, there is absolutely no correspondence between those two uh, fields, those two domains. And it was very ambiguous. But I played with this ambiguity. Uh, as I'm taught, many shapes appear, many tools of production. Bernard Cash from Objectile, Lean, Servo, surely the youngest team at the period. Uh, with Chris Perry, Van Berkel, uh, Clayton McDonald, Kovac from Australia, Osterreus, go there quickly, yeah? it's an old thing now. <laughs> okay, but the most important thing was the project of the, uh, the setting of the show, and uh, I had in mind to build a very rational space and to define for each team of architects a space of 45 meters square, exactly 45 meters square. But with a non-rational, some, some, something that have to be differently from a rational grid, something new. And I looked, I played with the mathematical concept of the moiré, uh, which is the concept bound to non-standard. And I tried to find a solution, how to define a fluid space which can give to each architect, through a very rational process, 45 meters square. It, it was impossible, it's impossible to solve. And somebody introduced me to a young architect, freshly just new architect, and the name of this uh, <laughs> architect was Philippe Morel. He, should, he, he was uh, 28 years old, I was 29 years old at the period, and I asked him, Philippe, uh, it's a challenge. Can you imagine a space where I could have 45 meters square for each architect in a complete fluidity and without any uh, or orthogonal grid? And uh, curiously, I was in a relationship with the Poincaré Institute. By himself, he, try, he tried to, to have contact with the Poincaré Institute, and he was in contact with two mathematicians, and he asked the question, how to do this? And they introduced him to a new uh, software named Mathematica. Nobody used this so, so software at the period, absolutely nobody for architecture. And he did it. <laughs> I was so surprised. He did it. Uh, he presented this to me with the, with the ribbon. And it's the scheme of the, of the exhibition. 
And it was surely for me the first architectural work made with Mathematica at the period. It's a beautiful drawing. And of course, immediately we had the project to do it. And we're playing, at, we, I, I forgot that we played with the grid of the Pompidou. We make an, an overgrid with the Moiré, because as you know, the Piano Rogers grid is uh, 80 meter, centimeters by 80 centimeters. And we, we transform completely the grid. Beautiful drawing. And of course, the first idea was to make it in, uh, in 3D. But it was uh, 1 million euro just for, <laughs> for the exhibition. And uh, at the end, we, try, we found a, a more economical uh, solution. But this, is, this was the first, uh, the first drawing. Calculus and Mathematica. And it was nice because we play also with the integration of the Bayer-Strass curve in the drawing. It's a mix. And it was possible to integrate all those parameters, purely formalist parameters, in the design. In this way, there is a complete contradiction between the work of the architects, which were for in their 40s, <laughs> uh, working with morphogenetic design, and the project of Philippe, completely innovative, working with, for the first time with Mathematica. This is the, the model, the original model in, of the Weierstrass curve. And I was very happy to discover that this model has a story. Uh, this is drawings published, uh, made in the 17th century, differently, close to the Weierstrass curve. This is purely infinitesimal. And this is a photograph by Manre. Manre made a photograph of all the mathematical models as surrealist objects, because this hyper-rationality with the surrealist and cubist idea of the fourth dimension in the history, the section d'or in art, Manuel was fascinated by the, the, the models of Poincaré. And he made many photographs and photographs of this one. And he was so fascinated that he made a painting. And this is a painting of, uh, of Manuel. And of course, I immediately used uh, this model to, I made another photograph in the same way. <laughs> And I made the cover of the, of the catalog. And of course, working in this way, I tried to understand what was the mathematical references in the history of art and in the history of design. And in the ribbon, I gave all those references in, uh, to the public. Uh, between Henry Moore, sorry, here, and those string is just the idea of the difference, the, the decalage of the, the, of the parallel in the infinitesimal, infinitesimal space. It's very important because it was before the anthropologic, anthropomorphic uh, sculpture of, uh, of, uh, of Henri Moore. And of course, uh, this is my, this here is uh, uh, Charles Eames, Max Bill, and as you know, Max Bill played after Vanton Gerlo with mathematics in the tradition of the, of the Tesseract of Vandersburg, the De Stael tradition, the idea of the fourth dimension. The Tesseract of Vandersburg is the cube in three dimensions displacing itself in the fourth dimensional space. Vanton Gerlo was absolutely fascinated by this, and uh, Max Bill was the disciple of uh, Vanton Gerlo at the period. This is the Tesseract. And there is many drawings of uh, Van der Boek about this tesseract, the idea to create, to initiate a differential space in fourth dimension. Poincaré and Weierstrass, other, some other models of the collection of the Poincaré Institute, but there is uh, 200 models in the collection. It's an enormous production, it was an enormous production of the period. And this is also very interesting because in the 50s, uh, André Bloch, the chief curator of, and owner of L'Architecture d'Aujourd'hui, published many articles in a magazine named Aujourd'hui, another magazine he owned, about mathematics and space, and uh, with a ma French mathematician, François Le Lyonnais, and he tried to understand what could be uh, n-dimensional space and what could be, how to represent those uh, multidimensional uh, aspects of the space. The Klein bottle, which became a reference for all the architects. And slowly, I tried to frame what was this, uh, this relationship between non-Euclidean geometry to building of space and shape, design, or architecture, differently from the, the most uh, traditional way to understand uh, architecture through geometry from the Renaissance, the idea of the grid, 
the idea of the perspective. This is the first work, very important work, by Bernard Cash, and I will speak about, uh, again about, about him. And curiously, I rediscovered exactly the same shape I found in Henri Moore or in André Bloch sculpture uh, made from file uh, to factory. It's surely one of the first work produced directly uh, from the software and built as an object with a, a five axis machine and it was produced, if I remember well, in 91. The, the Zemper project. And of course, this idea of the Moebius string appeared permanently in the design at, in, the big, in the middle of the 90s. Uh, this is the Van Berkel project. What was important for me is to define what could be those, what are, what was those morphology and why how they appear in the history of, uh, of uh, art, in history of design, and history of architecture. And I found many ideas of this differentialization of shape in the, uh, through the movement uh, in art. Uh, in photography, for example, uh, with uh, all those uh, photographs by Etienne Jules Marais. As you know, he, he worked on the movement of horses, he worked on the movement of, of the body, but he also works with those strings and uh, it's, a, it's a smoke, and propulsion of smoke, and it creates perturbation. All the dynamic of the fluid came as a tool of study for many, many architects, uh, artists like Molinaji, and uh, uh, as you know, all those uh, pictures, most of those pictures were reproduced in Vision in Motion, the famous book of Molinaji. Uh, and it's very important because Molinaji came to the United States, worked with Georgi Kepes, and uh, it's, a, it's, it's another history of architecture. And I frame this, on, all, all those pictures are in the ribbon. Something in engineering and in, uh, for, for architecture in itself, uh, there is an history of the curve. There is an, a real history, alternative history of architecture. So this idea of the inflection and movement and most of those works are absolutely famous. Huh? Uh, and there is many, many, curiously, many modern architects, not only uh, uh, expressionist uh, architects. And for example, this one is, you don't know, surely it's Lower X. You don't know who is Lower X, <laughs> some of them, some of you. Lower X is uh, an architect, Dutch architect, Dutch architect, mathematician, who worked with Berlag, and uh, against Berlag, or parallel to Berlag, with De Basel, a theosophist. And he tried to, uh, to create a theosophical rationalist space. And working on grids, he made the first grid in architecture, uh, and he was associated during five years with a certain uh, Peter Berens, and at this moment, two, two young architects were in the studio, uh, Le Corbusier and Miss Van Der Rohe. And all the rationality, of mathematical rationality of the grid came uh, from, uh, from Lower Ixt, and they planned with Berens to do uh, a book on uh, the, the regulation of the drawing. And curiously, he made grid, but it made, at the same time, he made uh, algorithmic design by himself, by hand, to understand how to mathematize the curve. Uh, okay, okay, many, many other projects, but uh, what's it is? At this time, uh, through the, all those algorithmic researches, uh, I was really fascinated by a very determinant project for me. It was the embryonic house of, of Greg Lean. And uh, I saw this work in 98, the beginning of the work, and uh, immediately invited him for the first Archilab I organized in 99. And for me, it was really a seminal work because, uh, when we'll speak about in a few minutes, it was the first to work with continuous, the continuity in mathematics, with algorithmic continuous and to create the discrete. The discrete is to singularize a shape in a movement and to bind both movements. It's not the discrete ran against the continuous, but it's to bound the movement of the discrete to solve permanently uh, discrete shape. And of course, he creates an incredible voc vocabulary and it's the embryonic house, uh, it's also a question of an ontological question, and we'll speak about also this idea. Uh, it changed completely the rule of the ontological question in architecture. Ontology in architecture is always defined through space. 
inscription in space, regulation of space. For the first time, a new ontological question appeared directly through the notion of the shape and the movement of the shape. It's a great shift and surely not sought really by Lean, by himself at the, at the moment, but it really, uh, it just completely the rules uh, and uh, all the interpretation of, of Greg Lean go back to, to space, to inscription of space and fail to understand this relationship between discrete and continuous. This project is really fascinating and uh, all, all the models produced at the period are really important. All this grammar, this uh, variation in the grammar. This, after that, is the T, the T set for, it's less interesting, but of course bound to the same process. I was also interested by Decoy, because Decoy played with modernist idea of the shape. It's a negative shape. It's the, it's the, the, the title of this work is Dans l'ombre de le doux. It's the shadow, the curve of the shadow of the perfect rationalist coupole by le doux. It's a negative shape. And I was very interested by this idea to, to play with the pure rationality and to create another, the negative idea of rationality, which is by the fact also very rational. And it's the glass house, and I was fascinated. I produced this model. I paid to, to, to have it in 3D. I believe that I could produce it in glass, but it was four tons, and uh, we made it in plastic at the end. But it's a beautiful project because it's also a shift. It's a glass house, but if you go in, if it's built, you're burned. Uh, <laughs> And I like this idea to displace all the iconic fundamental value of modernism at the period, to transfer them in another way, to perverse them, the, the identical, identical value of foundation, to perverse them from the inside. This project for also for me was seminal. This is a project of a shape by a Mosquito House by Roche at the period. And of course, surely the most advanced in terms of theory at the period, Bernard Cash, because as you know, Bernard Cash produced the first text, he was 25 years old, uh, about morphogenesis, and this text was read, read oh, sorry, by a certain Deleuze, who quoted uh, in Le Pli. And he was the first to introduce the term non-standard, and the period surely didn't know so well what it was, uh, historically, I mean, uh, but he was the first to introduce the term non-standard uh, in the idea of the morphogenetic and quoted as non-standard by Deleuze. And it's very important, we'll see why. And it produced also, for me, through the continuous, discrete shape at the period. The, it was only shapes. But singularity, new singularity in the mix, in this interrelation between continuous and, and discrete. Already at this period, I thought that uh, Annie Rashid's work became a little bit formalist. <laughs> but, but I exhibited it. And Servo, and this work by Servo, which is in a non-standard architecture exhibition, it's surely the first idea of a cellular network, which appeared in the design. I, it was also a little bit formalist because it was a tools, connective tools. But the idea to have a reactive, an interactive grid, which could be bound uh, through, like cells in a network, appear, uh, appear surely in this first work. How to define this idea of the inflection? Can we define it only through uh, algorithmic, genetic algorithm? Uh, I tried also to find an history of the movement through the idea of the body in the avant-garde and to find the dynamic of the inflection. It's very curious to see that this work, completely standard, is the idea to frame the movement of, uh, of the worker, to calculate what could be in joule. Joule is to calculate the energy of a worker who climb uh, 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 a slope. Purely a rationalist. But at the same period, same year, or two years after, the Duchamp, the, second, the sequentiation. The sequentiation is exactly this relation between continuous and discrete. But, and as you know, Duchamp worked on the fourth dimension. He wrote text on this. Schlemmer, the extension of the body. And uh, this is Greta Paluca. And this Greta Paluca was a great avant-garde dancer. And uh, this drawing was made by a certain Kandinsky. Try to understand 
what was the rationality of the movement from the Greta Paluca, and so on. And uh, this, this is uh, Loy Fuller, and as you know, Loy Fuller was uh, very, very important for all the Art Nouveau. Uh, and uh, for architects too, Guimard built the theater of uh, Loy Fuller. All this idea of the inflection in the ribbon, and uh, always the same thing, to build an alternative idea of the history of architecture, going through mathematics uh, with engineering ID, but also through art, and uh, which is uh, in margin of the traditional history. For example, why a certain Charles Eames do this shape before realizing all the furniture you know? Began by this experiment with plywood, with this ribbon. Uh, same thing with this uh, very famous drawing by a certain Le Corbusier. The modular began with a progressive differential equation as a ribbon, and so on. At this moment, uh, I try to understand in certain work of architects how to, uh, to work in a different way with this idea of the inflection. This is a bone, the inside of a bone, biologic. Uh, ID, and this is a network of a mesh uh, defined by Fraiotto in the 60s. He, he played with uh, wool string, wool in wool string. He put in a, a plastic, soft, and when they dry, they organize rationalist space. And he tried, as an engineer, to calculate the rationality uh, which appears spontaneously with the strings. And uh, Lars Pribrock realized the same experience. Uh, I exhibited this in a non-standard show to understand how appear an emergent, it's the term we'll see that it's important today, an emergent rationality which you can calculate, you can formalize uh, as a structure. This idea of the inflection, of the calculation of the inflection, was ver is very important for me because it's open to the, to the notion, the mathematical notion of the continuous. This is surely the most important work of Spiebrock because the architecture in itself is less uh, determinant. Hmm. It's not here. <laughs> and of course, this idea of the line appears also uh, completely uh, rationalized uh, in Bernard Cash. This is the Zemper Pavilion, referential to Zemper. And in a way, with the cellular work, <laughs> first cellular work of uh, Servo. At the moment, I try to think what could be the evolution of architecture in between this idea of shape and the idea of biomorphology which appear immediately at the period, not only now, but which appear at the end of the 90s. And I found also, in the story of architecture, many examples. The Luigi Colani car, the Bucky Fuller car, uh, the experiment made in the Bauhaus. Uh, here it's Molinaggi pieces with the students and so on. First example of uh, uh, morphogenetic design in a school of Ulm, uh, purely mathematical curve. Uh, transfer, like Poincaré, uh, represented in, uh, in, uh, in 4D. Uh, Bellini, it's a, a touch of a machine, just, uh, and so on. And of course, Gaudi, Gaudi here. And it opened to more and more to, to the idea of the shape. And most of those work are purely mathematics, calculated by engineers. Uh, this Candela, or Isler, uh, many, Kistler, <laughs> the Johnson Pavilion made by uh, Xenakis. Xenakis was a mathematician at the origin, working, uh, working with Le Corbusier uh, and doing, uh, doing this pavilion, and so on. And of course, the idea of the pure biomorphism, and it's so incredible to see that this structure, this structure is built by Nervi in the 50s, but is built it seems to be completely organic. Uh, Copy my blow, this model is here. 
from the frac in the exhibition, but ARP and so on. Many examples of such kind of organic architecture appear in the 60s. This is Ute Dominic, incredible handmade drawings about what could be a biomorphic design in a relationship with the body at the period, with inflatables. Surely you have not seen those drawings because I purchased all of them. <laughs> and of course, this idea of the biomorphic appears strongly in uh, the exhibition, in the non-standard exhibition, mainly in a formalist way. And uh, here you can see the contradiction in between the first work of Philippe Morel, purely made in Mathematica, and this morphogenetic design made by, through the software, you know uh, perfectly well. It was not Reino at the period, but surely Katia. Uh, and it's purely shape. It's not really uh, mathematized. And, uh, all those architects had never had no access to scripting at the period. They don't know what it was, and no access to uh, to the, the formalization of the software before the scripting in mathematics. Bosch, that's purely organic. It's, uh, can, uh, but it's shapes. Many shapes appear organic, but of course it seems to be the old word for you. I hope. <laughs> I was also interested by another idea which appeared at the same period. Uh, very difficult to understand is the idea of the parametry. With the idea of the parametry, you integrate in the continuity of the rationalization of the, of the, uh, the, of the uh, algorithm, qualitative, qualitative parameter or quantitative parameter. It's an integrative process. And it changed completely than uh, the, the rules with the idea of the, of the shape. It's a different way to think. This drawing, made by Decoy at the period, was surely interesting, very formalist now, but it, it was parametric. And this idea to, it's a, the movement of the dancer, like in uh, Loy Fuller, for example, uh, and he played with the idea of the moving parameter of the body. It's a pure calculation. It's not an integration of qualitative parameter, but it, it's a real parametry. And of course, when he tried to make this wall, very complex with pneumatic system, uh, he tried to place with a complete interaction between uh, the movement of the body as a moving wall. And he tried to, to understand how uh, uh, an architecture can integrate a uh, realistic uh, effect of the context. It uh, seems to be now very, very old because it's a, it's an, it's a relation between uh, structure and, and uh, outside and context, which seems to be uh, uh, an old thing, but it was very important. It was, it was very interesting for me at the period. And same thing with uh, this, those awful table by uh, Bernard Cash, but which are really parametric and produce uh, from five to factory. You can change all the parameters of the table and all the, the complexity of the angle uh, here, you know, those system change with the movement of the table and are directly produced in five minutes by the machine. It's, it's a fabulous project because it, the table are not interesting in themselves, but it's really uh, the same process used, for example, by Dassault system to, to change the shape of the piece. If you extend a little bit uh, um, a piece of an engine, all the pieces are changing and you can produce them with the machine. And he tried to do it with this project, which is formally not very interesting, but in terms of parametry, here, purely quantitative parametry, very interesting. And this is the way of the research of the MIT. And Axel Killian was working in, uh, with uh, Shirley, with Gary, for the Gary project, for the car of Gary, and with Mitchell, the laboratory of Mitchell at the MIT, uh, continue to work uh, on those, this notion of uh, parametric design from quantitative or geometrical parametric design. The idea is, how to frame this shift between this notion of continuity, I try to, to show in the exhibition here, so the idea of the sequence, and with the theoretization, which came from something you know. If you look at the, this generation of the 90s, all the texts written on this generation were written from an analysis which came from the 80s, and mainly by 
from this work. And what was curious for me, I was uh, in a uh, normal school uh, when Derrida was teaching, and I <laughs> heard Derrida as a student. And what was very curious for me is uh, I tried to push away this background in the 80s for me, Derrida, I met Deleuze and so on, as not as old, but as uh, trying to find a new escape, as you are trying to find a new escape in architecture. And it was so curious to see at this moment uh, the idea of the deconstruction, which came back by the United States as a kind of orthodoxy. And surely not so well read, not directly analyzed from the Derrida uh, strategy, which is close to, to uh, phenomenology, German phenomenology, not only Usher, but also Brentano and uh, many, many authors with, which are uh, never quoted, and which became uh, a tool to define architecture. Of course, the work of uh, Peter Eisenman is very important and stay as a, and will stay historically as very important. But the misunderstanding of the notion of the space in the Cora, which is a, a purely non-space from the Timé in, in philosophy of Platon, uh, created a great ambiguity because the analysis of the Cora became a theoretical tool to define uh, a, shift, a, a movement in the space, a non-space, which is a new idea of the foundation in the movement of the space. And, and uh, of course, there is a famous uh, answer to, to Eisenman in an uh, issue of assemblage, where uh, Derrida said, no, you made a mistake. It's not a special value. It can be instrumentalized as a special tool. The Cora is purely an ontological notion. It's the idea of an absence which create and define the, the word. That is really the geometry. In the Timé, before the triangle, which organize the word, the Cora is a pure negative receptor, rece receptacle, but which is not special, which, is, which can be ontologically defined. It's a foundation through a non-foundation. And of course, this idea of the specialization of the Cora by Eisenman was not acceptable by Derrida, but became an orthodox interpretation of the deconstruction in the, in the United States. From 88, the exhibition in uh, at the MoMA, but after that, with many, many author critics, we play with uh, the, the notion of space in Derrida, and Deleuze will see this, uh, as a tool to understand architecture. And of course, the idea of the sequenciation, which came from, uh, you have to see, you have to look for an article of, uh, of Peter Eisenman about Cataneo and Terrani, the grids of Cataneo and Terrani, uh, about the displacement of the grid in the first house built by Cataneo, the rationalist architect who died, he was 35 years old, mythical architect, and Terrani, same thing. And at the period, the, all the drawing, the ink drawing of the magazine is in Perspecta, were made by the very young architect uh, named Libeskind. And of course, the idea of the displacement of the grid was purely uh, a, a special displacement at the moment, a, an insight critical of the rationalist grid coming from this tyranny, an analysis of tyranny and Cataneo. But it's still special. And of course, it became a tool for Eisenman to develop this idea of the displacement of the grid as uh, uh, the roots of a, morpho a morphogenetic design. And the relationship, the relationship between Eisenman to Greg Lean appear very clearly, as you know, uh, as a kind of filiation or, or an avoid filiation exactly in this way. And for me, it was a complete contradiction. Those critics who use the uh, construction as a tool, critical tool, of course, Kipnis, twisting the separatrix means uh, playing with the non-space of the difference in Derrida, uh, the separatrix, this, non this, this new foundation through the disruption of the identity, which create a new kind of differential ontology. And of course, the idea of the diagram, uh, and so on. And the other is surely the lambda, with another roots playing with uh, the Deleuze idea of space. Why not? Yeah. As you know, Deleuze, as you know, no. Deleuze, <laughs> in the 60s, wrote his first very seminal book, Difference et Repetition. And if you read it, it's complex, but it's only referential to mathematics. He was at the period very interested by Albert Lotman. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, by all the movement of the, the mathematics in the 60s in France with the Boubaki school. And he played with this idea of the difference and the repetition. 
from there, he was interested by Leibniz. He, he wrote on Leibniz, differential equation, and slowly opened himself to a new, uh, new, an idea of an inside variation which can create a new notion of space and time. The Baroque and so on, the 17th century. Delanda played largely with, with uh, the tools, these Deleuze tools. And of course, to understand contemporary architecture, very frequently, you have uh, all the past deconstructive critic, Wigley, Quinter, Mertens, all Eisenman boys, or all the Eisenman produced, uh, Kipnis, so, of course, and the Landa uh, for Knox. It was so curious for me that all the analysis of the, con the movement of the 90s in architecture, which, which used obviously new tools, was framed by the deconstructive strategy coming from France through the American uh, way of understanding. It's, all, it's still a little bit the case today. I have this feeling, I'm sorry, for this uh, famous magazine you read each month. No, it's, it's, it's three months. At the period, I wrote an article against those special metaphors, it was in uh, 96, against the special metaphor in French philosophy. Uh, in figure centre, it means uh, the figure, like to draw a figure, but without to, to make the circle, to define it. And la pensée sans passant means south without the hand. The idea to define singularity through identity. And of course, what I discover is the fact that all those French philosophers play with special values and with drawing. They need to draw. For example, this fabulous drawing by Derrida, very famous, because it's the, just the drawing which defines the Cora we spoke about, this space. And the Cora is not a traditional, an, ortho, an orthogonal space, it's a displaced grid, very curiously. The difference inside the rationalist space. Roland Barthes makes some drawings. This is Deleuze, uh, this is Lacan, and this is Deleuze. And they made many. And of course, I made a complete indexation of all the special metaphors in French philosophy and literature. And as you see, I made a classification. <laughs> uh, the, the, the space with uh, an ontological value, uh, the space with in, uh, indicator limit, uh, separation, um, inscri differential inscription, metaphor, events, displacement, surfaces. It just, uh, as you know, if you read the book of Derrida, you have many, many special metaphors. It's, it's absolutely fabulous. I tried to understand why what, what, what was this idea to of the foundation, of the ontological foundation, which was refused in the difference and which reappeared in an enormous uh, variation of metaphor of spatiality? And same thing for Deleuze, of course, but for many, many, for Lyotard. Lyotard speaks about the skin, Husserl about the le champ, Deleuze le plateau, le pli, the fold, uh, la couche. Uh, uh, les, Derrida made many metaphors, but le parage, le sillage. Uh, the line, of course, the rivage, la rive, many, many, many special metaphors to define the emptiness of the foundation, the, the, the avoid of the foundation. They turn around and developing many, many special metaphors. And at the moment, I try to publish a collection of uh, critical texts, and I try to make a curious assemblage between Bernard Cash, and it was the publication of Thermob, Earth Move, which was published at the MIT, I published in France, uh, here it's Dumoncel, and it's a work on mathematics and Deleuze. We are in 97 now, 97, 98. And uh, Salonskis, you don't know, but I will explain where Salonskis. And I try to mix those two, those three schools, uh, those three new approach about space uh, in this uh, little collection. And of course, at the moment, I was very important interested by the non-standard. What is the non-standard, really? The non-standard is a mathematical concept. It's, uh, I, I will try to define this uh, simply. It's a purely, it's not a, it's not a mathematic, it's an analysis. And it's the way you define new numbers which integrate infinite. In the variation, you have 
uh, real numbers. Real, num a real number is a number uh, which is organized in a continuity of decim decimal. You can, you can share in uh, 10 by 10. And it's this continuity, purely mathematic, define a real number. With the non standard, you, and of course you go to infinite. In the differential equation, you go to infinite. With the non standard, you integrate the infinite in the calculus with new numbers which are approximative to zero, approximative to infinity, but which are numbers. At this moment, the discrete is involved in the continuous. It's all the game of the non-standard. And it's a great evolution. At the period, some, everybody know, and saw that uh, Robinson was crazy. So it was, uh, for the mat traditional mathematician, it was impossible. And he solved, Robinson, a problem. Leibniz was impossible to solve at the period. Leibniz tried to sink to the infinite, but he never organized a calculus which could, which could frame the infinite in itself. Robinson was the first. It's curious because a certain Benoit Mandelbrot uh, take the chair of, uh, uh, in, the in the 80s, beginning of the 80s, take the chair of Abraham Robinson. And of course, this is the, in the same way. All the works of the fractals is possible because you work with a non-standard analysis. It opens some doors for you, I hope. <laughs> same thing with René Tom. René Tom was the direct TCIP disciple of uh, Abraham Robinson. And the th catastrophe theory is the integration of non-standard numbers, analysis, non, non, this idea of the, to, to make that infinitesimals became number of the calculus. And of course, you can analyze new phenomena, the idea that you can, like catastrophe, like indetermination of space, uh, you can frame in a grammar. All the theory of, of catastrophe came from this book, Structural Stability and Morphogenesis, how to define, how to frame the movement of morphogenesis and the accident of the morphogenesis through a mathematical rationalization. And only the non-standard analysis can operate in this way. This is a very important symposium because we'll see, it will, it will be, how we come back to this. In France, the other mathematician who worked on the non-standard, was a really crazy guy, was George Reeb. And it's very important for me because uh, he worked on topology. For example, he was the inventor of uh, topological property of, uh, no, it's a, how do you say, feuilleté, as you say? The space which are with many layers. Yeah. And he can frame absolutely improbable, uh, in very complex space, the theory of foliation. And of course, through the non-standard. He was the first, really, with René Tom to defend the non-standard. And it was a French movement, eh, which not appear only uh, in the United States through Robinson. But the real disci disciples are Mandelbrot, René Tom, George Reeb, and so on. I will come back. Another way to define space is, uh, you know this very, very well here, no? you're a practitioner, good practitioner of Vor Voronoi uh, diagram. Uh, the Voronoi is just to define a rationality, a tool of rationalization of space through dots and proximity of dots. Seems to be, it's a tool, but curiously, I see this phenomena appearing in architecture very slowly. This is a uh, mountain, a chain of mountain. You can frame the, like exactly the fractals, huh? you can frame through the Voronoi grid the complexity of a territory. And at the infinite, from the big hill to the little detail, because you can go uh, from a large grid, from a grid, to an infinite <laughs> grid. And of course, you can freak traditional uh, geometry cube, for example, and you can make shape and extrude the tube, the cube, with the Voronoi curve. And you can make a not very interesting design or very fake design, like this one. Oh, no, this one is good, like this one. <laughs> and now, in uh, design everywhere, uh, you can purchase uh, this. This is uh, in sale or uh, on bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think. But it's, it's really uh, the most academical uh, translation of the Voronoi uh, curve. And of course, you know this. 
I was interested by this idea of the negative of the Voronoi, and of course the negative of the, the Voronoi is the distribution of points, and how to frame this distribution of points with, of course, non-standard analysis. The other way is cellular automata. It's an auto uh, generative system, you know very well. Everything is known now. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, oh, Morel. Philippe Morel worked with this uh, Voronoi curve in cellular automata to define an auto generative process. And uh, if I remember well, I produced this chair. Uh, which is at the Pompidou collection at the moment. And uh, I like this idea from the non-standard of an auto-productive tool to produce design from file to factory, but without any recurrence about the notion of space and without any recurrence on morphogenesis and the tools or old traditional tools uh, you use uh, still now a little bit. <laughs> and of course, the idea of the cellular automata which appear uh, in mathematics was framed by the famous author named uh, Wolfram. And of course you have uh, hundreds of pages on cellular automata in Wolfram books. And Wolfram, by the fact, is Mathematica. And uh, it's purely a cellular grid in two dimensions. You can develop this cellular automata, in, of course, in three dimensions or in n dimension, creating very complex objects. I try to frame, because uh, now we are at the borderline. We are far from the morphogenetic design. We open doors uh, to new tools to produce architecture. We saw the Voronoi, uh, the cellular automata. And of course, there is uh, some text written on cellular automata. And I, I play with this, because it's not some text. It's hundreds of texts. Uh, it's uh, something, the, the bibliography is something like uh, 200 books, uh, thousands of articles completely unknown from the architectural world, which don't care about that. Surely, most of them are very positivist, very formalist, uh, purely application. But some of them are very, very interesting because the cellular automata open doors to complexity, theory of complexity, theory of emergence, auto-organization, and of course, rationalization of the production and directly to computation. Exactly the territory we try to frame to understand what could be uh, the way to understand uh, architecture today. Complexity. And look at those names. Wolfram, Mitchell, we'll speak about. Many, many uh, very important uh, books appear. German, French, uh, English, of course. There are many specialists about this notion of complexity. And of course, uh, you know Holland. Uh, what Holland have done, but just to uh, just to work on generic algorithm uh, and cellular automata to define new notion of complexity and new notion of generative uh, and emergence, uh, generative and emergence uh, in societies, uh, in computation, of course. And this is a, a generic algorithm published uh, beginning of the 80s by by Holland. And the disciple, the disciple of uh, Holland is Melanie Mitchell. She's, it's very curious because she's not so well known. And she is the first who integrate completely non-standard analysis in the cellular automaton pro process. She wrote this book on genetic algorithm uh, in the way of Holland. Uh, she, is the, the, she, she was a scholar, a student of Holland. She made this PhD and developed the system. And of course, she worked uh, on the application of cellular automata, but in many disciplines. Could be uh, in biotech, uh, could be in meteorology, could be in uh, uh, signal exchange, um, uh, cell phone structure, so on, as a tool. I give you an example, for example. If uh, in LA you have uh, 100,000 100, uh, fire, light fire, yeah? If you, and all the coherence of the system is calculated through the speed of the cars, the interaction of the, cris the crossroads, and uh, the dynamic of the flux. Only cellular automata process can redefine completely the setting 
of, of this network if you change the parameter of a district. It's a new kind of rationality. And of course, this idea of the non-standard appear directly in computation, not only now uh, in the morphogenetic design, so on in mathematics, but of course in computation. And it creates a complete homogeneity of tools between uh, artificial intelligence, computation, biotech, any building of shapes. And it's the, the way, we are, it's the world we are living today. And uh, of course, the important thing for me is to connect architecture, we're speaking about architecture, to this incredible field of research, which is not research, but which is effective in the daily life. In France, the great disciple of René Tom was Jean Petitot. I'm more, mainly opposite to, to, <laughs> to what he's writing, but it's very important because he was the first to integrate theory of catastrophe to semantic system. And uh, he published Morphogenèse du Sens, first book. It was in the beginning of the 80s. And of course, uh, he worked slowly on the idea of the genesis, the genesis uh, of semiophysic system. In between, of course, cognitive idea of the sense, the building of the sense, to uh, construction of the, of, of the physical world. His disciple, I work with, is Jean-Michel Salanskis. If you remember well, I published the first book of Salonskis in 96, in my series. And of course, Salonskis is through, is the, he made his PhD with George Reeb. He worked with Petito. He's a purely the younger French specialist of the non-standard analysis. He published this book about the non-standard constructivism. And he's in between uh, semantic, uh, philosophy, mathematic, and application of the non-standard. And of course, he published this famous symposium about the continuous, labyrinth of the continuous. How the discrete can appear from the mathematical continuity is the question. How to, to solve the problem of a pure opposition between discrete and continuum. And of course, in this symposium, you have everybody. You have uh, René Tom, uh, it's not readable, but uh, you have Salansky, you have Petito, you have René Tom, uh, uh, Mandelbrot, and so on. And in the book, of course, uh, you have the framing of the cellular automata. Speaking about philosophy now, we go back to the post deconstructive movement in France through Derrida, Deleuze, and so on. How to crisscross, how to organize a, a new mapping in between uh, the critical phenomenology with many advanced uh, south by Deleuze, for example, the non-standard analysis, and the cognitive science. This symposium, absolutely determinant, was the first experiment to cross the three domain. And you found uh, Salonskis would play with Husserl. And as you know, Husserl, uh, the first text written by Derrida was on text by Husserl named L'Origine de la Géométrie. It's very explainable. Uh, it's the first, it's the, 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 the first text written by Derrida. Uh, he was uh, 32 on Husserl. And to bind phenomenology to, uh, of course, uh, what is a, a formal name, formal ontology. This movement is very important because it's, for me, very positivist. I'm not a formal ontologist. But try to define, through the non-standard, a constructive idea uh, of the, the foundation. And this symposium try to mix the idea of the critical uh, notion of the foundation through the construction in Derrida, la, differen la difference of the critical idea of the foundation, the ontological idea which came from the phenomenology, with the formalism which came from the non-standard, with an empirical idea of the cognitive science. And you, have, you see uh, different authors, like Barry Smith, I will speak about, Petito, as a, somebody who worked on the non-standard, new authors like Cassati, Longo, 
and of course, silence keys will work curiously about the notion of sense and continuous, continuous directly from the mathematic. This opposition of the continuous and the discrete, it's exactly like uh, the cellular automata, it's something like uh, 200 books, hundreds of articles, mainly mathematic articles, but some of them working on the idea of the ontology, this new relation between discrete and continuous, and the new idea of ontology means, it means how to opposite a traditional foundation which create identity, uh, the, in the juridical term, to uh, uh, the idea of the singularity as an emergence. Hmm? All the game is in between. And of course, this relationship between discrete and continuous in this, is in this way very important. And of course, the formal ontology, it's not a little movement, I can tell you. It's, uh, I spoke about hundreds of books for uh, continuous and discrete. Here is thousands of books. <laughs> yeah, it's a general system because why? why? The formal ontology can frame uh, all the cognitive process in, sp in, in uh, artificial intelligence. And it's why it's used as a main concept in computation now. And it's interesting to see exactly what is the relationship between uh, the formal ontology and the non-standard. And now there's many, many, many important uh, critics, historians like Liliana Albertazzi, for example, very important, or uh, Giuseppe, Robert, Giuseppe Longo, and so on. And you have, of course, each year a symposium, formal ontology in information systems. And uh, I have the feeling that in architecture you are working with information system a little bit. And of course the formal uh, ontology find application in many, many different fields. For example, Philippe Morel liked a lot this new theoretician in France working on phylotaxy, the morphogenesis of plants, Frank Varenne, is purely formal ontology system. Same thing to understand the, work, the web as a network, how the sense appear, how, how the identity, singularity of a sense appear from the network, from the complexity. And of course, this is a very important work also by Cassati and so on. And this idea of the special cognition and computation is not purely cognition in terms of positivist cognition. It's really through this idea of the relation between the discrete and the continuous, new tools to understand uh, the idea of the speciality. The inventor of the the formal ontology, the terms, one of the inventors, uh, Kevin Mulligan, many authors, I can't tell you everything, is Barry Smith, absolutely positivist. But this work was the first parts and moments, it speak about uh, what we're speaking about, elements, formal ontology, and uh, Barry Smith is something like, uh, if you look on the internet, 300 articles, uh, 20 books, it's a school with many, many people around. He got uh, the War Book Prize, $2 million, because all the system he developed from philosophy and from the phenomenology, from Bentano at the origin, uh, open uh, to application in computation. And of course, the company are paying a lot for the formalization in computation and the idea of the cognitivist, uh, cognitive science. One of the disciples, Giuseppe Longo, but those, those theoreticians are not unknown, that's eh? what I want to tell you. So, you can be against, I'm, I'm very in opposition with this very positivist way to analyze, but it's the field I think we have to work in with. It's, there is no escape because they are framing uh, the theoretical but also the practical world of today. And recently I saw this uh, little symposium which appeared and I was surprised because uh, Duffy is very interesting. He works on Deleuze and the mathematics and he framed all the works of Deleuze since the Différence et Répétition to Le Pli in terms of mathematical works, mainly analyze the notion of the non-standard. And I was very surprised to see appearing Salonskis, my old uh, friend, and also the Landa, which came back with a very academical interpretation of the space in Deleuze. But it's curious to see what the intuition I had in 92 uh, came quite true with this very, if you want to read something on Deleuze, you have to read Deleuze. <laughs> But you can read this if you want to understand what are the mathematical roots uh, of the south of Deleuze. All those names, Badiou and 
Chatelet was a mathematician I, I know since I was in the philosophy college in Paris, uh, are very, very important. But to see all those names, which seems to be so far, Salonskis in uh, the non-standard uh, formal ontology, the lambda coming from the United States, an academic uh, deconstructive vision of Deleuze, and, uh, and Duffy, Australian, all together are reframing now the objectivity of the territory, uh, of the understanding of the relationship between mathematics and architecture today. What to think about today? <laughs> of course, uh, many works appear, the new generation, and always dealing with space, with the notion of space. I was so surprised to see the works of Ocean North, which is for me very prospective, but two books with the notion of space. The space reader, you know, you know that, and the idea of the specialty in reference with still morphogenetic design. Voronoi? Voronoi. Voronoi. I like this work a lot because it's the reverse. Don't play with Voronoi grid as a shape, but with the dots and analyze the, the body. And we spoke about with Alicia. Uh, I have to tell that uh, uh, when we spoke about the symposium, Alicia sent me a last decisive mail five days ago. What do you think about the relationship between discrete and continuous? <laughs> and I told him, told her that I can't answer. <laughs> I, will tell, I will tell you during the symposium, during the, the lecture. This idea of the dots is very important because exactly the reverse, not to analyze uh, Voronoi in terms of shape, but to analyze Voronoi in terms of distributive points. So surely, I don't know if it's clear for uh, fairness, but surely uh, non-standard distribution. And I like this because it created a chair. chair. And it's completely different from the, the works of uh, Ocean or uh, from the work of the Voronoi grid and so on. It's up another kind of work. There is a shift for me. It's a new work. And surely the, one of the first one uh, which opened a new way of thinking and a new way of uh, defining architecture not from space as a foundation. To escape from space. Space is very important, but it's only one parameter between many parameters. It's an incredible shift for architects not to put space as the primer, the, the, prim, the, 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 the first definition of architecture since the Renaissance. It's incredible. It's not information, it's not a productive tool, it's not software. It's really uh, to understand that you can build something and space is only one of your parameters. And geometry is not definitive in this system. Furnace, exactly the reverse. This shape, very organic, very mineral, is defined by dots and not by the shape. I don't like this one so much because, uh, of course, <laughs> I like this. Because it's open doors to biotech. You can mix after the process between non-standard in biotech and non-standard, of course, in, uh, in space, in architecture, in materials, in physics, and so on. You can mix the t all those domains. You can, you can hybrid them. Akapia. It's the Austrian. I like, I don't, it's, it's purely morphogenetic, but it's negative. I like this idea of the negative. <laughs> if you sit there, this is determinant, and surely uh, Alicia is very advanced for me in this way. You can integrate in the process, because it's a mathematical process, and after that, you can integrate more and more qualitative parameters. Space is a qualitative parameter. Movement is a qualitative parameter. Distance is a qualitative parameter. But it's an uh, interrelation of agent, interrelation with uh, uh, physical aspect, or qualitative, like heat, like uh, sun, light, uh, and so on. And slowly, human parameters. No, just like the design. I like this because, uh, if you remember well, Greg Lee made a chess board. And uh, you can see immediately the difference of generation. I like this a lot because uh, we are really in another world. 
how to build in a purely rationalist system the complete indetermination of shape. It's a, it's a new way to think to architecture. Of course, and then I like to push the system at the limit with the color. Modernism was uh, tough, hard, uh, was uh, cold, uh, was rigid and geometric, and the architecture of tomorrow could be uh, soft, uh, uh, warm, uh, gloomy, and so on. It's a, we are in a different world. Of course, impossible to to make this with a morphogenetic knowing traditional uh, with a morphogenetic software. It's too complex, and of course, it was never done before, even in. A <laughs> Even in the most advanced research about drawings made by uh, uh, the, 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 art, the artist of the Art Nouveau who work with, uh, with plants, with design of plants, the nature never created so complex shape. I like the, the mutation. I like the bad taste in the drawings. Yeah, it's purely uh, two systems of information which cross themselves and create perturbation on the uh, bread. You know that. This came from here. Yeah. <laughs> this is autogenerative system. This is a I like this because it's an artist. Nothing to do with architecture. You don't know you, you don't know what you are doing. He's just playing with uh, cellular automata to make drawings and that's it. He's alone. Nobody knows his work. But uh, it's interesting. Just some example to see you the difference with the beginning of the lecture and the old world. And of course, my preferite. <laughs> no, because here, uh, it's really, for the first time for me in this work, uh, the door is open to the integration of outside parameters. It's absolutely decisive. And the architecture of tomorrow will have to deal with the integration of, in the process of outside parameter. And it's already done, for example, uh, here. It's a neural network. And it has to be effective because it works directly for a surgeon. Uh, what is it, surgeon? Yeah. So I'm saying it's uh, how to design mutation in, uh, in the reactive neural network. And reactive means that uh, how to understand the relation between synapse in function of outside effect. And it designs shape. And of course, those drawings are not uh, scanner representation, but are simulation. And all the relation between uh, simulation and reality is decisive for today. We, it's possible to simulate this process and to reproduce it in different ways or in different disciplines. This is nano architecture. And as you know now, they are architects. Surely one of you will be architect for nanotechnologies. They need architects. Our a nanoparticles can penetrate a nanosystem. It has to be a, it have to be designed. They need an architecture, and they need architects. And it's uh, just a photograph of a of a plant. No more. <laughs> it's surely architecture of tomorrow. Thank you. Is, is I wanted to say that uh, the request of Alicia was to define a field. It's not a theoretical con lecture. I can make it uh, because the, I'm preparing a book, and the title will be Architectural Mathesis. And it's a title, but I made <laughs> Architectural Mathematics. But uh, it's just to give you a kind of map. It's a mapping to give you uh, the field, the territory you can play with, integrate, or refuse, and so on. But really, because I have the feeling that. Uh, most of you are between 20s to 30s and have the feeling that you will have to deal with this world and not with the other world of references. It's the world you are you will be the, the practitioners of tomorrow. Any questions now? OK, well, while they're thinking about questions, I will ask one quick question which relates to my 
question that I keep asking about this uh, discrete and continuous. You keep saying that we are re uh, getting to uh, the discrete from continuous, but what about the other way around? Because lots of mathematics that we are using um, start with a kind of discrete, uh, discrete generation via discrete, and the discrete then arrives to... The continue. discrete in the mathematics is the finite number. It's very, very easy to, to think. And uh, the continuous is through the algorithm, the idea of the, an open number in a series. It creates a set of a series. The problem is how to define new singularities in a series and how the discrete could be involved in the series. It's the word open by the non-standard analysis because the number is infinite, is part of the calculus. The number S, S or R, uh, is a number which is integrated in the calculus. It's why uh, you can uh, frame uh, in a completely different way singularities means that you leave the word of closed identities aesthetically and of course it's a new ontological field because you have to think to this and of, in this way Deleuze had the intuition of this word. Uh, speaking about the non-standard, about the algorithm, all the work of Deleuze was to leave the old metaphysic of the foundation, of the being, uh, to go to another kind of uh, uh, operative thinking close to the word of, of singularities. The problem was the, 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 to be trapped by the notion of space, which was not uh, the Baroque space uh, in the 17th century coming from Leibniz, uh, was not the work defined really by the opportunities of the non-standard. He stay in the thinking in the south of differential mathematics, differential uh, equation uh, through uh, 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 Lotman. Uh, was uh, his master in mathematics. Sorry, just to pick up on Alyssa's comment, uh, Frederick. Um, with Deleuze talking about um, Leibniz and monadology as well, and you, sh you end on like things at a nanoscale. So I'd be interested to know how, how you see, say, the formal characteristics of working maybe at a micro level through, like, if you imagine, say, Poincaré's n-body problem, and you start to design through micro interactions, Library? micro in micro interactions. Ah. So, for instance, you showed some bull um, names like Bonobo um, or um, uh, Stephen Wolfram. So they're dealing with very local level rules, either a cellular automata or an agent network. So. In that case, all the affiliations amongst the parts are at a highly local level. You could say at a micro scale or a nano scale, um, yet the order is coming out that's emergent. So that in some sense, there is some continuity there, and yet at the same time, there are singularities. Sometimes there are local symmetries, but nothing happening at a global level and locally. How would
uh, makeup is becoming very It's, it's really uh, almost things out of like biology but may not really do much or they just, you know, they I just look. I, say, I yeah. think uh, surely the modular will, not, will be not be the good rules <laughs> to create a parametry for the next year, a urine parametry. But I'm sure that it will be possible uh, through this very complex idea of, of a uh, biotech prod productions, uh, auto production emergence to create uh, rules, and but the rules have to be defined uh, locally uh, to be in a second way defined more universally. I think it's important to because uh, this idea of the qualitative parametry will organize singularity. Some of them will be functional and not functional, adaptive, and not others not adaptive. It's like a, a it's, real, it's really open to experimental architecture, but like uh, experimental science, to see w what is resistant <laughs> or what will be dissolved in the system. And I think it, it's, it's the way for me, uh, uh, you will be the producer. You will, you will have to make this, like, those experiments to an integrative architecture and to see at the end what, this, what stay uh, stand, standing and uh, what is uh, unused or uh, absurd. Uh, linking a little bit with that as well, you were showing in, like, in the non-standard uh, exhibition that most of these architects were working with the modeling of form through some softwares. Do you think that architecture could actually jump that step, this filter of geometry in the, in the computer and jump from this kind of information or mathematics directly to like, the work of Matias del Campo that is like, dealing exactly with matter? not going through this modeling of geometry in some sense? It's a very important question. You know, I, I was uh, working with uh, Cash from Objectives since years. I was so surprised to see that he accept the critique of Mario Carpo, uh, purely uh, specialist of Alberti in the Renaissance, and go back to uh, orthodoxy of the, and validity of geometry. Very surprised. Uh, to say that uh, uh, ontologically we don't need space as a ontological tools to create, to define the juridicity of the foundation, it's one thing. It doesn't mean that you pushed away the geometry. Um, but the geometry has to be integrated in, this, in its complexity, in its complexity in the system. It's it changed the way you play with geometrical uh, rules. It doesn't mean that uh, uh, we are in a purely organic, uh, smooth system, uh, auto-emergent. But in a way, could you say that we somehow uh, decoded or encoded geometry as well because we went uh, one layer more down in a way. So the, the, the ingredients, uh, whether one is working with this kind of cellar automata models or uh, other information models like um, agent-based systems, multi-agent based systems, uh, you produce this kind of fields of uh, data that then could potentially be a formative elements yeah. of geometry, but, but like but the diagram as well, chance, we are beyond uh, Alicia, the diagram. I'm not architect by chance, and uh, I've not to solve such kind of problem. I just try to define uh, the aesthetical and critical field in relationship with uh, 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 the actual temptation, tentatives of theory uh, to define space, to solve really uh, this problem as a building or as a constructive process. Uh, I can have intuition, but I'm really not architect. It's really, uh, I don't, you know, I'm so fascinated by the tools you are manipulating. I, I don't know, understand exactly how it works. I have to be very honest. I'm only, uh, I'm a, a spectator in this way <laughs> of your work too. <laughs> uh, I just try to understand what, uh, how the research of architecture of today can be in connection with all the field of research and which define, uh, a critical vision of the world you can deal with. Well, just I, I stop at this step. That's fair. Other questions? Or okay. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You, very much. <laughs> you wanted to kill me.